Welcome to another episode of the Headlight Restoration Pro, where I'll be showing you how to take headlights like these and turn them into something like this. Picture perfect, better than the day I rolled off the lot. Flawless. Flawless. Victory. Also, we'll be going into when to wet sand and how and when to check your work. You got to meet those checkpoints, because if not, you're just going to end up with scratches in your finished product, and we don't want that. Check it out. He's heating up! What is this? What is this place? How could you be worthy? And you kill the other guy. Let's get down to business. This is a 2013 Subaru Impreza. And if you look at it before I get started here, um, at first glance you'd be like, it's really not all that bad, right? Sometimes headlights can not look that bad, but look at all this. It's really bad. She's losing an estimation of about maybe 45, maybe even 50% of her light. Because pretty much uh, the way I can gauge this, I give the customers estimations of how much light they're going to gain and how much light uh, they're losing. It's a little complicated, and it comes from experience and um, just the working knowledge of headlights and how they work okay um being that you can't see in certain spots or it's really hazy in certain spots this particular light is going to deflect and reflect light different ways okay it's going to scatter her light not only blocking her light but it's going to scatter it so instead of a straight beam you're looking at uh you know like a flashlight is if you have one of those focused flashlights that's how your headlight's supposed to work like a straight beam it will shine across the street and all that shit right um these lights will perform more like a street light Okay, they'll just be all over the place, but they won't be focused, which messes up your field of vision and your driving. Okay, so this is why she called me, and her number one complaint was I can't see at night, and when it rains, like it just did before I did these headlights on uh, the day before, um, it uh, you know makes it even worse, it makes it ten times worse once the water gets on there, because the water then starts uh, you know refracting and deflecting light and doing all kind of weird shit to it on top of what's wrong okay that's why with any vehicle it's more difficult to see when it's raining but anyhow uh she was losing on this light about you know like i said 45 50 percent something like that of her light output which is um significant very significant and um just for another um gauge or uh, rule of thumb when the headlight is totally white like this you would be losing about 95% if you turn these lights on because you can see in about, you know, as good as that light can see out pretty much. Okay, because what you are seeing, only thing the eyeball registers why you see it is it is transmitting images of light to your brain. Okay, that's the only thing you're seeing. And your brain deciphers what it's seeing. So that's pretty much how uh, light works. So if you're not seeing in there, it's because there's no light going inside there. If there's no light going inside there, there's no light coming out. So that's pretty much the basics. It's really complicated, and maybe I'll go into it another time. But it's there's a there's a science to tell how much light is being lost on um, you know, the headlight when the output is coming out. And uh, this also has a lot to do with why you should never coat a headlight like this when it's foggy like this. Because as you know, and I know, there's a lot of detailers or um, uh, uh, headlight pros out there that are Mega coating the headlights up. like this. Okay, when they're foggy and messed up like this. But anyhow, let me get back down to uh, what this video is about. When to do checkpoints and when to wet sand, as you see right now. Oh my god, the Headlight Pro is wet sanding. Okay, so if you mistake me saying uh, dry sanding is superior for wet sanding having no place in Headlight Restoration, you must not have been paying attention or you comprehended it incorrectly. Because wet sanding has a good place in Headlight Restoration. And if you don't, if you don't recognize... Uh, a, a, a huge step in my process is wet sanding. When I hit the 3000, the uh, Trizac 3000 is wet sanding. 
So wet sanding always uh, has a place. And like I said, you can't limit yourself. When you have, um, you know, I always go back to this reference because it's the best metaphor, okay? Um, you know, when you have people that do, uh, you know, combat sports or whatever, boxing, uh, kickboxing, whatever, when they limit themselves, some are more efficient than others, okay? Um, you know, uh, tends to be kickboxing is very efficient, you know, then, you know, more efficient than others. Um, striking methods or whatever, right? But, um, and I am an MMA fan, I'm a boxing fan, I'm all contact sport fan. But anyhow, um, if you limit yourself, if you're in that field, right, and you're an MMA fighter, and you limit yourself, say I just do jiu-jitsu or some shit like that, right, you're probably going to get beat up sooner or later, right? That shit might play you know, with some people, but sooner or later with somebody knows how to do the same shit and, and, you know, you're going to get beat up, right? So what they try to do is master or focus on different disciplines, okay? That's why it's called mixed martial arts because it's all kind of shit. Somebody might be practicing in four or five different martial arts. And the, uh, the method behind that and the thought process behind that is when you become you know, good enough at each one of these, you become a more proficient fighter or more efficient fighter. So that's the same thing why I say that this style of headlight restoration that I use is like a mixed headlight restoration, okay? It's a, it's a MMHR, okay? It's a mixed headlight restoration. So every, every thing, what I try to do is I try to take all the good things out of other type of restorations whatever's good if I could salvage something good out of it and use it to my advantage for this method uh, which is one of the reasons why this method is so evolved and why my headlights come out so amazing okay why my headlights are so healthy and why you know I I have like a hundred percent satisfaction rate okay literally I have nothing but five star reviews okay literally I've never had an issue and if I had an issue somebody said oh man this is uh something's wrong here guess what I do I come out and I make it right That's just part of the thing. That's part of the game. That's how uh, the real ones do it. But anyhow, um, yeah, wet sanding. And those little areas right here like this, okay, um, as you see, I'm using a double stuff on this, okay? So um, this light might look broad, which it is, but it is very roundy on uh, certain areas, okay? And the whole thing is like a little bubble, so there's really no flat area, too flat of an area here. So I'm using a double stuff just to get the proper grip on everything. But those corners right here, this stuff right there, uh, this is where I tend to wet sand things like this because they become, you know, very difficult and they become a pain in the ass, even for people like me or even for me, you know, as good as I am and uh, I'm the head of restoration pro, all that shit, right? Um, <laughs> it, they, they, they're a pain in the ass for me and if you hit it wrong once, then you're going to be sitting there for a lot longer, five, ten minutes. You have to keep coming back over and over again trying to fix it because sometimes if, if it hits the side of these pads, it will uh, dig those little areas out. So what I'm doing when I'm wet sanding those areas, I'm putting a little extra sensitivity and smoothness because as you know, wet sanding is a hell of a lot less sanding. It is uh, it is by nature 50% or more less stronger than dry sanding, let alone dry sanding with a, uh, uh, a machine. It takes it like a thousand times less strong. So what I want is sensitivity and, uh, you know, care and, uh, you know, a little more attention in those little areas right there. I want to get all that coating off, but I don't want to leave too much of an issue for me to have to fix and it took a while for me to figure out I need to add something in here different and I used to go there and used to you know hit these parts you say oh man they got these fins on the line damn it they got this turn on the line and and then I would do it and I would mess that part up and I'd spend so long trying to fix it this right here this method you see how I dry sand first okay and then um, I wet sand but this method will you know far as uh, when to wet sand will definitely help you with this method. Okay, and now I'm wet sanding. So the, the the principle behind this is whenever you dry sand with something, okay, whether it's by hand or machine, you're getting 
pretty much the full extent of the pad, okay? Let me be going up there too because there's like a, a lip that gets really difficult to get with uh, the rotary motion, but easy to get, you know, by hand, back and forth, or lateral movement. So um, anyways, uh, with a dry sand, you're going to get the full, you know, when I dry sand the corners right there, those little uh, ridges, you're going to get the full amount of uh, sanding, okay? When you wet sand, when you put any kind of water or lubricant on there, it cuts it down from full. So just that little bit of water that I put there in that corner well, when I wet sand it after I dry sand it by hand, took it from like a 800 probably to like a 600, or like a, uh, you know, maybe a 700, 7 something. It downgraded it. Because when you're wet sanding it, 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 it downgrades the power of the, of the sandpaper, okay? Um, that's what it is. Uh, that's what happens when you wet sand. It, it zaps the power. It adds lubrication. Sanding is a product of friction and heat. So when you are wet sanding, you're, you're killing the heat. And you're killing off the sanding ability. You're killing off the friction by somehow. Just like if you put your hands together, right? Say your hands are dry right now. And you can do this experiment right now. And I'm, you know, sometimes I got to watch what I say because I don't want you guys to hurt yourself or whatever. But um, this won't hurt yourself, okay? This won't hurt you. If you put your hands together and you rub them together real fast, okay? Well, you know, as long as you don't feel any pain or whatever. Just real quick. <laughs> Right, and you smell your hands, it'll you smell that they're burning. That's friction. Okay, now add some water in there and try to do it. You won't smell shit. Add some liquid in there, some soap or anything, just even water. If you get your hands wet and try to do it, you won't smell nothing. Okay, guarantee it. So that is um, the point of the wet sanding. Okay, in a proper method or in a proper sanding uh, schedule or proper sanding. Um, uh, assertion or proper sanding order. No matter what you're sanding, if it's plastic, metal, or whatever, you start with like a dry. It's 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 a textbook to start with a dry. Okay, whether it's hand or machine or whatever, and then you enter into wet sanding. Wet sanding is supposed to be more of a finishing step. Okay, it's just above. Actually, it's just below. Uh, polishing, okay? Wet sanding is, you know, once again, a finishing step. So when you start something with a finishing set or step and you do the whole process with a finishing step, it just kind of grammatically doesn't make sense. So um, that's what I say. Uh, you know, I never, uh, you know, I always try to get my point across that I'm not bashing. Uh, wet sanding by saying wet sanding is inferior or, you know, hand sanding is inferior. Um, it's inferior compared to machine sanding or dry sanding, yes, but it does have a place, okay? It does have a place when implementing it correctly. Okay, as you've seen through this video, um, the checkpoints to... Um, to check your headlights, okay? Um, after this one, it's going to be probably the biggest, um, after you do this step, is going to be the biggest checkpoint that you should ever do, okay? All those other ones that I uh, flashed on the screen, checkpoints, those are ones, you know, you should be checking every time you're finished. You should be looking up close, uh, you know, doing a general scan of the area. If you see any gouges that catch your eye too much, then you go back over them. Um, you know, it's plain and simple. And when you keep doing that, because a lot of people are doing all this and they're getting to the point right before they spray and they're like, oh my God, look at all this shit here. I get all of, they're all over the place. And then sometimes they're not even checking and they're just spraying because at first glance it's clear, but you haven't done any investigation or nothing like that. So, um, you, you really got to look and you got to investigate. You got to do all that shit to make sure that there's no scratches. And like I said, if you do all those checkpoints, by the time you get finished with this one right here, this checkpoint coming up after this, you should not really have any. And if you do, it's going to be minimum. You're just going to have some spot fixing. Also, by the way, um, I should have said it in the beginning. Um, but I am uh, experiencing a uh, little technical difficulty with my voice. <laughs> uh, my daughter and I got a little sick. I went out and worked in the rain for two days, 
and um, you know just got a little bit of wet and uh, scientifically it doesn't really get you sick but uh, she just had some shots and stuff too so she got a little sick and then maybe got me sick and then I got her sick whatever happened but yeah um, I'm just getting over it um, and that's why my voice sounds a little weird so hopefully it's not too annoying but anyhow um, and even when I'm when I'm doing this step right here and I'm 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 polishing and I'm going out when I'm watching that end of that spindle there I am looking all around it to you know see if I have any red flags of anything looking weird or anything having scratching or blemishes or anything I need to address so I can keep a note on that's why you see I'm rubbing that spot there to check and make sure I'm I'm generally doing a whole check on all over the place check all over the place there's some stuff there I didn't like some stuff there I didn't like um, but I'm checking all the way through when I'm going. It's not just one time like when I'm done, I look all over, which I do do that. But um, the whole time I'm doing this step, I'm looking. And this is where I saw one. And this is where I saw some stuff. And now what I'm doing is I'm gauging how bad uh, the little leftover stuff that I don't feel comfortable with Um is okay sometimes it'll be bad enough where you need to use a p500 again and, and run through the whole step you know the whole steps uh you know p500 p800 the uh 3000 again but with sometimes you could just use the 3000 again or you could just use the 800 then the 3000 and then polish um but nevertheless as you see i'm spot fixing i'm checking my work um one of the biggest things i have uh, in my bio is people like it came out so awesome and better than you know I've ever been able to achieve doing other methods or whatever right but I still have a little scratches left over and I don't like them and I'm, what, what should I do right and I tell them like it's it's you know sometimes I tell them you know like more than likely you have them from pushing too hard using the P500 that is uh, you know Stage one, you know, you, just like one of those murder shows, my, you know, my woman be watching all the time. Uh, the first thing happens when a woman comes up missing, who do they, you know, who do they suspect? The husband, right? They're going to question him. It's the P500 is the first thing you think of, okay? Because that is the wrecking ball. The P500 or anything uh, stronger than that, like the P220, P3, 320 or whatever else, okay? Um those are the ones you look for because the P800 and the P3000 are not scratch makers per se. They are scratch removers more than likely, okay, um, in this process. Okay, so um, basically I tell them that because it's true, but in, an, you know, in a real scheme of things, it's there because you didn't check your work. You got to check your work. You got to hit those checkpoints. You got to not just look at them like, okay, fuck it, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna spray over them. You know, no, you look for them. Make sure it's right. If you gotta sit here and, and spot fix, you know, for another 15, 20 minutes, do what you gotta do and then do it. If you want the perfection, that's what you do. If you just wanna, you know, you know, bullshit, you know, that's what you're gonna do. But if you want that perfection, you gotta think, you gotta think, if I spray this, you know, or if I sit here and fix all these things, it might take 20 minutes, but if I spray this and the person isn't happy, or if I'm not happy, what happens then? I have to take it all down and start over again. You can't just go underneath the clear coat and fix it. No, you have to remove all that clear coat and start over again. So you're going to be spending way more time doing that and then initially still fixing all those things than just doing it the first time. And that's what I had to train myself to because I, I still have it to this day. It happens sometimes. And I, you know, used to have an issue with it. And, um, and, and that's what I would tell myself to get out of those issues when I get into those little slumps or in the beginning, like, damn it, I, you know, it's perfect and they like it, but I don't like I saw a scratch there or something, right? I'm like, and, and then I started being more meticulous and I started doing all these checks. You see that? Look at all these checks I'm doing, right? I'm looking at all these things and I'm looking to make sure everything is the way I like it. And, you know, and that's how you're supposed to do. And then even still right here, there's still still a little bit. I got rid of about uh, 80% of what I didn't like, and there's still a little tiny spot right there I didn't like. So 
So what am I doing? I'm doing it again with the P800. I'm going deeper. And, um, you know, that's what you got to do. If you want to be on this level, if you want this level of perfection, you Perfect. have to hit those checks. Okay? You have to hit those checks, and you have to be real rounded and know, um, you know, you got to use different things. You can't just use a flat pad, one pad for every light. Sometimes you're going to have to use the double stuff. You, you have to check all your work. You have to be versatile. You have to have that MMA effect to your headlight restorations. Okay, and first and foremost, which most people have a problem with, which I would say the second thing is in my DMs, but more than likely, it is the second thing, okay, because the scratch is first thing. The second thing is people just don't listen. They don't listen. And then they come on, you know, the chat, and they're trying to, like, lie, like, oh, man, you have every tool that you use. I do everything that you did. And this and that, and sometimes I'll be like, okay, walk me through the process then. What did you do? Okay, so I did it with the P500 with this drill, and then it's like, no, it's not the same drill. And I look up the drill, and it's like, okay, it has way underpowered or whatever, right? And then I, you know, wet sanded by hand, and then I did another drill, and I'm like, eh, 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 like, shit, you're not even, you're like at the beginning of telling me what you did, and it's a whole different process. Okay, so when, when uh, you know, it's like if Mike Tyson is like, you want to learn how to fight, right? And he tells me, hey, uh, this is what you do. You put your foot here, you know, to the right, and then you throw the punch, you know, uh, across to this way to the left. And then I say, okay. And then I come back. It didn't work. I don't know what happened. And he's like, tell me what you did. I'm like, oh, I put my foot to the left. I'm already wrong. And then I, I swung to the left. Like, it just, it just makes no sense. Like, it's so bizarre. Sometimes people are telling me, like, I, I did all these things. And it's funny because they try to tell me, and I got, I'm sure you guys have seen it in the DMs. They try to tell me that I've done everything that you said to do and this and that. And it's like, and it's like a hundred percent you have not because I've showed you over a hundred times. And this is just, this is just on this channel. Like, okay, let me hold on. Let me sidebar real quick. Somebody told me about this, and you know what? You can always learn from from something new about everybody, right? From anybody, okay? Whether they're skilled or whatever. I never knew there was a red dot here, and I looked it up. It's supposed to be for the max efficiency of spraying, okay? A gentleman I was in communications with told me about this, and I don't think it matters, but just for shits and giggles from now on, I'm going to line up my nozzle with that red spot. You know, I, I never even thought about it. I thought it was like, I always wondered what it was, and I never looked it up or never figured it out or whatever. But somebody told me, and I was just blown away when I looked it up or whatever. It's supposed to be for max efficiency. You face the uh, nozzle that way. But from doing it, this last couple of headlight restorations, I don't see a difference. But, hey, just for shits and giggles, if that's what they're saying, I'm going to do it. But anyways, you've got to pay attention. The number two thing is paying attention to what he, I'm telling you. I'm the person that has really done this many headlights. I, I've probably done over 2,000 by now, okay? Uh, with this method. When I give those numbers, I mean just this method. You know, and I haven't had to evolve my method since I started doing this. It's evolved a little bit with little wet sanding this and this and that and those little tiny knickknacks, but it's basically the same. Okay, because I used to do three, four, five different other methods until I perfected it to the way I want. And they were all good and because of my skill set, but I wanted perfection. They weren't perfection. All right, but um, you have to listen, okay? Do step by step. You can change things within reason, but it's going to make it a lot harder because... Just just believe I have tried all those changes. I have tried to use different discs. I have tried different clear coats. I have tried different methods and applications of clear coats. I've been tried, uh, you know, applying it after different stages. And nothing can fuck with this. We've tried the 500 and 800 grid, then, then uh, clear coat with... Uh, 2K clear automotive, uh, acrylic, um, you know, all kind of shit. I've been tried a spray gun. I've tried heat guns. I've tried, you know, uh, I got a $500 something dollar UV heat lamp in there. I should put on the you know, marketplace or something to sell it. Um, you know, it's useless. I've tried all these different things. It's insane. 
if you know so many experimentations so many different cars um, and nothing even comes close to this method and the thing is I'm giving it to you guys for free when I was beginning and I got on the internet all I saw was bullshit and I thought it was work spoken word back then I thought oh yeah this guy's on here and this and that but the thing is none of them were professionals and then you know even now there's some professionals on here that be playing and I say no names because it's not what this is about but uh you know this is it spoken word this is the truth Stay tuned, you can do this. He's heating up! What is this? What is this place?